Madison, we are so glad that you're with us. I invite you to get settled in as others log on and um, enjoy the prelude that Nathan will play, and we'll begin worship in about 10 minutes.
May the joy of God's love be with you this morning. May it kindle hope within you and in our world as we celebrate Easter together. It is good to be with you, whether you are joining us on live stream or on Madison Public Access later or on YouTube. Welcome to all of you, members of First Church and friends and guests alike. Just one announcement before we move into our worship. We are offering a number of ways to be connected and to be church together in these challenging times. And we're communicating mostly through our weekly email called the Tuesday News. So if you would like to receive that email, please uh, give a call or email the church office and we will gladly include you. Please know that always, in whatever ways we can, we are here for you. So friends, even though we are not physically here together, we are united in spirit. So I invite you to take a moment as we begin worship, breathe deeply, connect with your spirit, and with the presence of one another of all of us who are gathered this morning, turning our eyes to God as we open ourselves to the ways that the Spirit is at work among us, especially on this holy day when we celebrate that though Christ has died, he is risen. Let us be together in a spirit of prayer. Holy One, you are a God of eternal and steadfast love. This morning, we celebrate the truth that nothing can separate us from your love, not even death. Help us to receive this news with joy this morning. Quiet our fears and anxieties. Open us to your unquenchable life within and among us, leading us always through the joys and sorrows of life, through challenges and hardships, through pain and even pandemic, through death to resurrection and new life. We pray in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Early on that first Easter morning, two women came to see the tomb where they had laid Jesus' body, and an angel met them there. And the first thing that the angel said was do not be afraid. This messenger from God would have us know that is good, that God is with us still, and therefore, regardless of how things appear, we should not be driven by fear. There is a deeper peace that can be ours, a peace found in the steadfast and powerful love of God us through whatever comes our way. So friends, may the deep peace of God abide with you. I invite you to take a moment to share God's peace with one another, whether you type in a greeting on the Facebook feed or spend a moment calling another to mind and sending out a love and blessing of peace. The peace of Christ be with you.
Good morning and happy Easter. Every gospel writer of the church has traditionally referred to them as evangelists, bearers of glad tidings or good news or God. Each of them tells the Easter story in a slightly different way, which makes a degree of sense, of course. The four evangelists wrote at different times, in different places, to a diversity of audiences out of a variety of cultural settings about an event that took place anywhere from 40 to perhaps 60 or even 70 years past. So this morning we hear Matthew's Easter story, which is surely the most dramatic of the four. It begins quietly enough with two women making their way to the tomb through the pre-dawn stillness on that first Easter morning. And then seemingly without warning, all heaven breaks loose. The earth is violently shaken as an angel descends upon the tomb. The stone is rolled away and the guards stationed there by the authorities wither in the face of God and fall to the ground paralyzed by fear. Mary and her friend can only stand in silent awe and wonder. Matthew never seems to be content to have his story sit quietly on the page. His dramatics speak to his desire for this story to possess us to get its grip on us and convey to us that understanding that an earthquake and angelic proclamation have left one world and entered another. So on this Easter morning, unlike any we have known before, we invite you to listen with fresh ears and an open mind and heart as this new world is revealed to us this morning in our telling of Christ's resurrection, taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the, the stone and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing shone white as snow. And those standing guard were shaken by terror and fell to the ground as though dead. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you were looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead, and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message. So the women departed the tomb quickly with awe and with great joy and ran to bring the news to his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them there in their path and said, Rejoice! And approaching him, they took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go now and tell my disciples to go to, De to, go to Galilee. There they will see me. This, dear friends, is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I was here a little early this morning, ostensibly to dress the cross outside our front door in white, but mostly because I just treasure the peace and stillness of early Sunday mornings. So I went out a little bit before 5 a.m. carrying the white sheet for the cross, and the first thing that struck me was how dark it really is at that time of the morning, and cold. And then the stillness and the silence hit me. It's quiet before dawn. No birds, no cars, no barking dogs. I couldn't help but wonder if perhaps the quiet is somewhat more pronounced in this season of social distancing and enforced isolation. But in any event, it was really quiet this morning. So it was hard not to think of these women, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, making their way quietly through their own pre-dawn darkness to sit vigil at Jesus' tomb so many years ago. And it was easy to think as well of all that has passed in the life of creation in the intervening centuries. Wars and plagues, of course, times of apop uh, apop 
apocalyptic fear and hope as well, but also glories of art and literature and music inspired by that morning. And then there are the private and public hopes excited by it. And those great works of faithful and prophetic witness to this idea that what may seem lifeless in our eyes is never truly dead to God. So I was giving thought to all of this, walking out through our Cairo garden and managing somehow not to fall down the stairs in the darkness, when I came pretty close, close enough to stepping on our skunk. And I say our skunk because we've met before once or twice around campus, but never at this hour. So this was perhaps a little more traumatic and unwelcome than either of us wanted. So off he went, or she, in one direction, and so did I, around the corner of the building to see the cross. And having composed myself, entering again into that sense of quiet and peace, just then along came the 510 Amtrak Acela with a great rush of noise erupting out of the darkness. But all of it, the stillness and the chill, the shock of the skunk and the sudden noise of the train, if not quite the earthquake and angel of Matthew's imagination, certainly they reminded me that Easter brings a lot with its arrival every year. Peace, assurance, and hope, to be sure, but also a healthy reminder that the resurrection always meets us in a world in constant flux. So I think because of this, because the world seems to be in constant flux around us, Matthew's is a good Easter story for our world today. It's not exactly history in the sense that we know history, but Matthew is deeply concerned with history all the same. And tradition holds that the writer of his gospel was a tax collector, most likely because there is a story in the gospels of a tax collector named Matthew leaving his post and following Jesus. And it is certainly within the realm of probability that this biblical Matthew was the apostle most deeply connected to the historical community that came to tell and shape the story that ultimately became the written version of Matthew's gospel. But the written story as we have it today is almost certainly the product of another great and faithful imagination one educated both in Greek and in the ancient religious law of Moses. More than any other gospel, Matthew reflects on the connection between that ancient law and the hope and promise it contains within the history of Israel and his own claim of Jesus as the Messiah of God. Littered throughout his gospel are references to the Hebrew scriptures, our own Old Testament and his debt to his own Jewish tradition is particularly evident in what has been called his apocalypticism. Now there is a vital distinction to be made between Matthew's Jewish apocalypticism and the Hollywood apocalypticism many of us Americans are so deeply fond of. Hollywood in its cinematic rendering of apocalypse typically focuses and concentrates its energy and imagination on the end, the end of something. Usually they're zombies. But Matthew is different, dramatically and radically different. He is far more concerned not with the end, but with the question of what comes next after the end. And Matthew, to be sure, knew what the end looked like. In historical terms, he knew what several ends looked like. In the first place, he carried the memory of those first disciples' grief over the death of their beloved friend and brother, Jesus. For them, even the resurrection could not overcome fully the trauma of the passion with its betrayal and denial and suffering and death. But the writer of Matthew's gospel would have known more endings as well. He would have known the experience of exile, as a member of an early group of Palestinian Jews who had come to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. 
but who felt increasingly isolated and pushed aside by family members and friends who didn't share their faith. He would have known the pain of departure, of leaving Jerusalem for a new home in Antioch and the formation of a new community, a new church. And finally, he would have known of the devastating events of 70 AD when Roman soldiers lay siege and then utterly destroyed Jerusalem, burning her temple to the ground and bringing to an end the way his religion had been practiced for centuries. So the writer of the gospel would have known all manner of endings, all manner of deaths, from the loss of friends and family to the loss of his home to the greater loss of his sense of national identity, his sense than the ashes of Jerusalem, history itself seemed to have come to an end. Over the past few weeks, I've had this recurring experience with those things in my life that I can only describe as commonplace, right? The little rituals or repeated words or familiar images that are so easily taken for granted in what used to pass as normal time. Excuse me. Perhaps you've had this experience as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Perhaps you've had this experience as well since the advent of the COVID-19 cri uh, crisis and its acceleration over the past few weeks. I've had this experience of hearing and seeing and saying all of these commonplace things, but hearing them and seeing them and feeling them in radically different ways. After weeks of social distance and isolation of encounters with friends and neighbors at a safe distance, all of these things seem to have taken on a new meaning. Take the Lord's Prayer as an example. With its petition for daily bread, that has never sounded quite the same in the past as it does now. Same holds true, I suspect, for the Easter story, never in my lifetime. Do I recall that the resurrection has landed with such weight and force as it does today? So I feel a deep connection to what I believe the writer of Matthew's experience was as well. A sense of loss and dislocation, alienation, anxiety, fear for what the future might hold. But also his deep, passionate hope that no matter what the end looks like now, there is still a future that God is shaping and forming and dreaming for us and in us and eventually and ultimately through us. So as he came back again and again to this story of God raising Jesus from the dead, especially in the light of these world-ending events going on around him, he must have invested all of his enormous and faithful imagination in crafting a version that acknowledged these truths both that the world does come to an end from time to time, but that God never allows the end to have the final word. And as much as I might wish it, skunks and warning trains are not signs of an apocalypse. Sometimes viral pandemics are, though. It more or less depends on what we do and what choices we make in light of them. But for Matthew, earthquakes and descending angels are clearly signs that something is coming to an end and something radically new is about to be born. For Matthew and for those who have followed him for centuries, nothing created out of the mind of God stays locked in a tomb forever. More so than the other resurrection stories, Matthew's is concerned with investing his readers with a clear sense of vocation. Even as the tremors of the earthquake still ripple around them, even as the angel speaks to Mary and her friend, do not be afraid, there is an immediate word of commissioning, a purpose given to all of the chaos and the loss and trauma, go quickly and tell my disciples. Going and telling are deeply important actions throughout Matthew's gospel. So the resurrection really serves as a culmination of his commissioning 
process. Being on the move is so deeply essential to his idea of the church. This act of sharing the story of going beyond established boundaries and carefully drawn borders to proclaim good news in further and further circles. In fact, it is literally on the move in the very act of going quickly to tell the disciples that the women run headlong into the risen Christ. There just must be something to that. There must be something to the idea that in their movement, in their willingness to go and tell, that that is where the risen Christ meets them. So if the empty tomb signals the end of an age, if something new indeed is emerging in that moment and in this one, it is best not to be caught standing still, or worse yet, looking back. Like most of his gospel story, Matthew's resurrection story is marked by a sense of conflict between what we assume to be possible and what is, in fact, possible in God. We believe, for example, we can love our neighbors as ourselves, but Matthew is not content with what seems possible for us and from us. The Jesus of his faith and imagination invites us further, commands that we also love our enemies, that we pray for our persecutors. Because, I suspect, if we can do that faithfully, what then remains beyond the realm of possibility for us? What limits can we possibly place on God's resolve for our future? What limits can we possibly place on our own capacity and willingness to meet that resolve with the actions and choices of our own lives? What priorities will emerge following the end of this season of pandemic? that will proclaim the great truth of our faith. Christ is risen, dear friends. Christ is risen indeed. The question that awaits us, that awaits our response, that awaits our movement, is how will this life newly raised by God out of what seems dead and gone continue to animate the way we as a church, we as people, move forward into the world that is now emerging? Will we be gripped by the same old stories, the same old practices, the same old reliance on things that are now past? Or can we find ways to be faithful, open, receptive to all that God may yet do in us and through us? Rejoice, beloved of God. Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. Christ is always rising. The future stands open and waiting. Thanks be to God and happy Easter. Amen. we go now to the quiet center of worship, drawing near to God in prayer, I invite you to share your prayers through the Facebook feed so that we may hold them together. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let us pray. O oh God, for gathering us today, for your word of hope and promise, for your unconquerable spirit, that lives in and sustains us through whatever comes our way, we give you thanks. These are challenging times. We find ourselves in a tomb of sorts, closed off and held distant, waiting in the unknown, many of us grieving and fearful. Remind us that this tomb does not separate us from the love that created us that gave us life. Grant us a felt sense that you are with us through each moment. 
Open us to cooperate with the ways that even through this, you are bringing about new life, redeeming what is being broken and lost, leading us to greater wholeness. We bring to you all that we carry with us in this time, lifting into you transforming love the burdens that we bear. May your tender care be with Pat and Mary, Catherine, Willie, David, Sharon, Keith, and Bob. We pray for Diane and Stephanie, Ethan, Carol, David, Peg, Fred, Jody, Aileen, Patty, Jan, Donna, Anthony, Franco, Rob, and Betty. We offer prayers of comfort and condolence for the family and friends of Richard Passera, as well as Dan Albrecht's family, whose burial is today. We pray for your comfort and love to surround all who have lost loved ones. We pray for all people who are sick with COVID-19 in hospitals and at home, and we especially remember Emily this morning and pray for her healing. We pray for continued recovery for Jonathan and for Jim. We offer prayers of gratitude for healthcare workers, and we pray for their safety and protection. And we lift up Mickey and Maddie and Rob. We pray for the many who have lost jobs or been furloughed and all who are anxious about how to make ends meet. We pray for those deemed essential workers who continue to work at their own risk. We pray for teachers and students struggling to do school in a new way, for parents at home balancing work and school and parenting. We pray for leaders, for their guiding us through this time with compassion and wisdom. And oh God, because I cannot seem to remember to bring my phone to prayer, I'm going to go and grab it again. <clears throat> this way I can lift up any prayers that I see that you have asked. So we continue our prayers for Maddie and healthcare workers. And we pray a uh, happy birthday to Todd on Tuesday. Oh God, we entrust all of these things and more to your loving care. We pray that you would help us keep our eyes on you as we walk through these days, and as we wait for and seek to cooperate with your redeeming love and the ways that it comes to us, bringing about new life among us, leading us with each step towards greater wholeness. All this we pray in the name of the living Christ. We join our voices in the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
cannot see your faces this morning, we're heartened and gladdened uh, by seeing the names of all of you plastered throughout the, throughout the sanctuary. So, someone once said that the best way to understand a story is to pay attention to how it ends. Well, the truth is, the Gospel of Mark, excuse me, the Gospel of Matthew. The resurrection story there, the Easter story, doesn't end really with the resurrection. The resurrection is, is in a sense, a new beginning. What we are going through now will come to an end, and something new will begin out of it. So my blessing to you today is to hold that great central and foundational truth of our faith close in this time. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. But also that Christ is always rising. Always rising to meet the movement of our hearts, the actions of our lives, the ways in which we find newness in all that God creates around us. So blessings to you this Easter Sunday, this Easter season, and all the days that will come to us in the future. Go in peace. Stay in peace. Amen.